Welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, our guest is Jonathan Neville. Jonathan has written 10 or more books on the Book of Mormon. He is a thought leader in what has come to be known as the Heartland Model. Where did the Book of Mormon actually take place? Jonathan, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Greg. I appreciate it. Jonathan, I want to start right into this. And I'm going to make a quote here. I'm going to get a quote from you from one of your books, one of your recent books. Here's what you state. I stipulate that the message of the Book of Mormon is more important than its geography or historicity. Believers rely on spiritual impressions more than physical evidence. But lingering questions about authenticity impede acceptance of the book as scripture. Readers want to know whether the books, people, and places are real. Does this really matter? Well, I think it does, both anecdotally and statistically. Um, you know, that particular comment kind of arose from a, a discussion I had with some missionaries once. They asked me to visit a, an investigator with them, a, a friend now, I guess we call him. And he was a, a Christian minister from Wisconsin who had moved to Utah. And he had never really encountered Mormons before, so he was curious. And this was their second visit. And when we showed up, he had printed off a whole ream of paper from uh, farms and um, Fair Mormon and stuff about the Book of Mormon. And he had two copies for them, but he didn't have one for me. And I said, that's all right. I know everything that's in there already. But he said, I read the first, I don't know, 50, 60 pages of the Book of Mormon, but I'm not going to read another page until you guys can tell me this is a real history. Because as I've gone through the internet, you guys don't even know where any of these things took place. And the missionaries, of course, are defenseless in that situation. And so they turned to me and I said, don't worry, I can handle this. And so I talked to him and uh, went through it a little bit then. But as we left, the missionaries told me that they couldn't go back to see him again. And I said, why not? And he said, because our mission president told us that people like that aren't ready for the gospel. They're asking challenging questions, and we're not supposed to go back. But if you could go back, that'd be great. So I did. I ended up having a friendship with this guy. We had each other over for dinner. We went to, uh, he invited, I invited him to church where I was preaching, you know, and he invited me to his church. So we went there. And at the end of the day, he ended up moving back to Wisconsin. But before he left, he said, I'll tell you what, we probably won't resolve this until the next uh, live. But you have convinced me that if Camorra is real, it's in New York. <laughs> OK, I want to get to that because Camorra is central to this whole battle. Yeah, totally. of of of, you know, the Mesoamerican model versus the the heartland model. There's others out there, but these are the two primary right. competing models out there uh that 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 people are almost being pulled apart just from the geography of, of the book of mormon we're going to get into that a little bit more here's what you well, said well, about let, let, let me yes. just say something about that that's why i wrote that passage that you started with mm -hmm. because i don't think there's any room for contention about all this stuff and, and i've adopted the idea of the multiple working hypotheses right where people can believe whatever they want about the geography it doesn't um, affect the message of the Book of Mormon. But I think there is an element of rationality and historical honesty in, behind all of this that we'll get to as you go. But I just wanted to, to call that out because I, I do really think that the message of the Book of Mormon is more important than the geography. And I think it's ridiculous to have any contention about this. To have debates is fine. But hopefully people aren't really getting angry about this stuff. Yeah, I will say it does seem to me that that people almost I mean, people are some people are very into both sides of this. Right. They they do. They get very invested, um, maybe too invested. That doesn't yes. mean I don't mean too invested in the in sense of intellectually and research and anything like that. I, I just mean emotionally yes, uh, exactly. attached yep. to to these different hypotheses here. But you bring this up with Camorra. Mm -hmm. uh, the Camorra question is not so much about geography as it is about the reliability and the credibility of Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery, their contemporaries and their successors. A lot of what you've written about and researched 
has to do with zeroing in this 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 historic model to directly back to Joseph Smith and you add Oliver Cowdery in there quite a bit. So the very origins of the early tw- of, of the 20s, the 1820s and the statements that were made there especially early 30s also but why in it seems to me that that your 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 approach seems to say something like this correct me if i'm wrong the further we've gotten away from the founding of the church and the translation of the book of mormon the more nebulous things have become through academia yes and and we need to turn back the clock in a sense going back to the origins of the statements of actually what joseph smith and oliver cowdery said instead of pulling from scholarship that has looked at second and third and fourth hand accounts is that correct yes well it's a, the way i look at it is very simple because it, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's unequivocal what Oliver Cowdery said about Hill Kamara, right, in letter seven. But even before that, there's several other accounts that we can discuss when we get to it. So the bottom line is, do we believe Oliver Cowdery or not? I mean, he was the assistant president of the church when he wrote that letter seven, where he declares unequivocally it was a fact that this is where Kamara is. But the underlying issue is, why did he write that letter seven? And he was responding to Mormonism unveiled which was the anti-Mormon book published in October of 1834, which promoted the Spalding theory, which was that Joseph Smith basically read a manuscript that had been written by Solomon Spalding years earlier, which was a novel, essentially, that explained the origin of the mound builders in Ohio. And so that was what Oliver was responding to, the, the claim that the Book of Mormon was fiction. And he said, no, it's not fiction. In fact, it's a fact that it happened right here. Now, he also told Brigham Young about going into the repository and so forth. So he he wasn't just speaking uh, theoretically. He had actual experience in the Nephite repository in the Hill Cumorah. And so for us at, at this point to say, well, Oliver was wrong. He was speculating. He didn't know what he was talking about. To me, it is just ahistorical. So what is the evidence? Here, here's something that I, I, I need to understand, because you, and you write about this also. But you talk about in the 90s, there was a bit of a shift uh, in, in the scholarship. And we, we, we moved more toward the peepstone. Uh, and, and the idea, well, I, I will get to the translation of that in a minute. But okay. there's... I had all. I started studying and went for a few years. Real excited about the geography and everything back in the nineties, mm-hmm. and, and and looked at the heartland and looked at other things, you know. But it really was the Mesoamerican model that had taken over. Right. And I had always understood that the Mesoamerican model stated that yes, it was the Hill Camorro in in New York, but it wasn't the same Hill Camorra that the Jaredites died on, right. Rama, right? It's a different Hill Camorra. There are two Camorras, is what I understood back then. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't as much, you seem to kind of split this, and, and maybe I, I'm behind the, the eight ball on this, or behind the curve on this, that you seem to split this into saying that academia now is saying there is only one Camorra, which is in Central America, Mesoamerican area. And that there is only a tradition that the Hill Camorra in New York was called Camorra. And, and so I always understood that, no, it, they did call it Hill Camorra, but there were two of them. Can you distinguish yeah. that for me? Okay. Well, that's, that's why I have this acronym called M2C, which is a Mesoamerican two Camorra theory. And this is really originated in the late, 1800s, early 1900s with the RLDS scholars, Stebbins and a guy named, ironically, L.E. Lewis E. Hills. I mean, it's like the simulation gave us a guy talking about two Hill Camorras and his last name was Hills. Can, it's <laughs> one of those bizarre uh, scenarios. But so they they determined that um, the Book of Mormon took place in Central America, which is too far away from New York. So Hills actually published, I think it was in 1917, he actually published a map 
of Mesoamerica showing Camorra there. And they said, well, sure, Oliver Cowdery talked about Camorra in New York, but that was just uh, like named after the hill in Central America or something, which is what some of the BYU scholars say today. So it was it was almost like the Camorra New York was an honorific, uh, you know, a recognition of a hill that's actually in, in Mexico. The problem with that is Oliver Cowdery was so specific. He said, not only is this the hill Camorra where the last battles of the Nephites took place, but it's also where the last battles of the Jaredites took place. It's it's unequivocal. And and so to come up with this M2C or the Mesoamerican two Camorra theory, you have to say, well, Oliver Cowdery was wrong. He was just... He, he was it, it, the way they do it is they say he was expressing his opinion that it was a fact because <laughs> he declared it was a fact and and throughout those eight letters he distinguished between things that he was kind of speculating about versus new as a fact and one of them was for example he talked about the stone box that Moroni constructed and he said we don't know how far down he he constructed it but it had to be far enough or placed just right so that it wouldn't erode and also wouldn't get covered up. And so he talked, he speculated a little bit about how Moroni might have done that. But when it came to facts, he he declared it unequivocally that there's only one hill Camorra, it's in New York, it's the same one that's in Mormon 6-6. Do we know where that stone box was, more or less? Uh, well, there's, there's different anecdotes about it. I think... Uh, when Edward Stevenson went out there, people showed him where it had been. And early in, in the early days of the Hill Camorra, after the church purchased it, there used to be a marker showing where it was. And if, you, if you've ever been to the pageant, you know that, how they cleared all the trees. And on the south side of that, near the top, was where the marker was. It's actually not too far from where they, they built the set of the box that Joseph opens. It's not too far away from where that is or where it was in the pageant. We we'll go over a few of these points that you make here in, in contrast with the Mesoamerican model. Uh, number one, you state if you believe the Mesoamerican model, Mormon wrote his abridgment somewhere in Mesoamerica, right? So Mormon before he handed it over to Mormon and hit up all the Nephite records in a repository in Hill Camorra. That's Mormon six six as you reference. Right, a hill somewhere in southern Mexico before giving these plates to Moroni. So that's the first assumption that would have to be made. Right. Correct. Okay. Number two, thinking he would not live long, Moroni adds a couple of chapters to his father's record. Then he travels 3,400 miles to New York and hides the plates in the stone box, thinking he would not live long. Or he keeps the plates with him while he roams around Mesoamerica for decades, taking before taking them 3,400 miles up to up to New York. There's a couple more here, but before I say that, I mean. There's no question, as long as you, as long, there's two things here. Number one is, is what I brought up before, is that Hill Camorra in New York? That's number one. Number two is, even if it wasn't, why are the plates in that hill? <laughs> well, right. I mean, even if, even if yeah, you said that's a traditional name, why are the plates in the hill? Why are they in well, New York and not in Mesoamerica? It's inexplicable to me. I mean, I, I think the Mazo guys would say that Moroni knew that Joseph Smith was going to end up there, and the Lord directed him to take that long voyage up there. The problem is that in letter number four, Oliver Cowdery was describing Moroni's visit, and he even says in there, he says, you know, I can't tell you exactly what time of, day, of night it was when when I came, because Joseph can't remember or, or doesn't know exactly, but it's around this time. So he was talking with Joseph Smith about this right in the letter. And and he had mentioned earlier that Joseph Smith assisted in the writing of these letters. It's just that Joseph wasn't a writer much. So he had Oliver Cowdery do it. But he, he says right in there that Moroni told him that the record was written and deposited not far from his house which means it had to be written and deposited in Western New York. So this whole idea that Mormon composed it in Central America contradicts even what Oliver, what Joseph and Oliver together described as what Moroni told them that night. And now it's even worse than that, but that's just one example. There's more examples I can give you too, but. Well, I mean, there are several examples. I mean, you, you offer several that you, that you've written about here in yeah. terms of, 
uh, Oliver Cowdery's words, Joseph Smith's words specifically. Yeah. He specifically states it's Hill Kimura. Uh and that uh, that's you know so so there that that's kind of going along the lines of what I would usually do if I'm reading scripture or trying to find truth. There's a model that was put forward uh, by. Uh, Bruce Porter and, and Rod Meldrum on this. And actually, I agree with this model, right? There's four different things they look at, and this is the hierarchical structure of trying to get to the truth. Yeah. What, first is the prophetic evidence found in scriptures. Yeah. And so I, that to me is always the same thing, whether it's the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham, and I'm looking at all the other, what I would call lower law issues that, that are surround and, uh, co- and create controversy, et cetera. I, I want to know what's in the text, number one. Right. Second, the prophetic statements of the inspired translator, Joseph Smith. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Third, the physical evidences. There's our first lower law issue. We get there. And then fourth, the geographical passages. So you can kind of construct something that's in place. I think that's the right model. I think that's the right way to do it. The question yeah. is, is are the conclusions right? Uh, well, yeah. and, and, and this is this is what uh, my Mesoamerican American friends of Book of Mormon Central have told me. They said, we the priority for us is the text itself and whatever that's what we stick with and then secondary to that is maybe what joseph and oliver said about it but the text itself rules and my point is that's an absurd approach because the text is subject to interpretation and it, you know I, I asked them well why are you even looking in the americas and they said because joseph said it was in the americas and i said all right you've already left the text because the text doesn't refer to the americas mm-hmm. And so the whole their whole approach to me is irrational and actually ludicrous, because if you're going to say that you stick with the text, then the whole world is open for examination. And I blogged before about how you can take the geographical passages in the Book of Mormon and fit them into numerous locations around the world. That's why there's a geography in Malaysia or Thailand or Eritrea, you know, all these different places, because it's so subjective. You know, you can't even say how long a Nephite walks in a day. That's a subjective measurement. A land northward, a land southward. You know, in my view, that's a, uh, a relative term. Other people think it's a proper noun, which doesn't make sense to me. Is And so you can you can debate the interpretation of these geographical passages. Even the, the Mesoamerican guys disagree about where the River Sidon is, for example. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, it just shows you the subjectivity of this whole thing. And that's why, to me, I, the text is what what it is. But what Joseph and Oliver talked about, the Hill Cumorah, was what Moroni told them and what their personal experience there was in the depository of records. And so when you when you say, well, they were wrong, then actually it gets to what you alluded to earlier about the translation, too, because I see this as a as a slippery slope kind of thing. The, our, our scholars have decided that Joseph and Oliver were wrong about the Hill Camorra, even though they were explicit about it. Okay, so let me, let me just hold you on that real quick. So yeah. you're saying that they're saying that they were wrong. Do they come out and explicitly say that, or is that your interpretation of what they're oh, saying? Oh, yeah. No, they do. In fact, I have one. I, I just happened to have this little book, <laughs> yeah, I, The I World of book. Joseph Smith. You know that book? Yeah. And they talk about that in here. Uh-huh. John Clark says Joseph didn't know what, what anything about the Book of Mormon, and that's evidence that he actually translated because he didn't know what it was about, So, so in words to that effect. And and they, they have all these pictures in here of... Uh, the Mesoamerican stuff, you know. Well, that's a, the Times and Seasons articles. And that's their rationale is that um, Joseph and Oliver didn't, were ignorant. They were just speculating. I mean, there's a great, it, it's ironically great. Uh, on Book of Mormon Central, they write these things called um, No Wise. Yeah. And the articles, I call them no wise, N O W Y. Because they're. Come on, you, some you of those go, are pretty good. Some of, some them, of them are great. I do I, disagree I with say, some of those, but some of them are pretty good. I say 80 to 85% of what Book More Essential does is awesome. Mm-hmm. But it's all tainted by the Mesoamerican stuff because they, they first they undermine Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery on the Hill Camorra by calling saying they're ignorant. We know better than they do. And then they went the next step on the translation, saying, well, they misled everybody about the translation, too. And so, 
You've got the two only witnesses to the restoration of the priesthood, the bulk of the translation, if not all the translation of the Book of Mormon, and all the other events, and they're undermining their credibility and reliability. So to me, that's that's kind of a non-starter. It's not even rational to say that Oliver Cowdery was true and honest about everything, except when you talk about the Hill Camorra in the translation. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, you know, as a lawyer, I look at stuff that has to be rational and make sense. And that position doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So, I mean, again, so going back, looking in through history, drilling back through the academic, the scholarship that's been done, you're you're going you're going back to the historical statements by Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, primarily those two, yeah. and 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 cr- trying to find the signal among the noise, so to speak, going going directly to the source. Yeah. What? Well, let, let me tell you kind of the next step from that, because you know I'm I'm I was a total Mazo guy for like decades Mm -hmm. because as a real fan of farms when it started my first my last year in the law school was jack welch's first year there and and i Mm -hmm. spent some time talking to him about hugh nibley and all this stuff i love that stuff and i kind of went along in my career and doing other things didn't focus that much on it until i was uh, working on a novel about native americans reclaiming their land and someone said oh you need to talk to rod meldrum and so i went and talked to rod and i he said, oh, if you want to know about this, you got to come on a tour, <laughs> a tour of Ohio. So I said, OK, I've never really been to Ohio much. And it was mind blowing for me because for the first time I, I thought, well, this makes a lot more sense. How do we ever get started in Central America? That's what led to the Benjamin Winchester stuff and all that. Well, what I realized is you can take any theory you want and find evidence to support it. It's called confirmation bias. And that's what these Meso guys have done. Brent Gardner is one of the best examples of it because he's isolated down to this king, wow. Mayan king fits the description here and so on. But you could you could take world history pretty much anywhere in the world and find parallels to the Book of Mormon in terms of the wars and the battles and the social pressures and so on. That's human society. So it's kind of a generic um story in the Book of Mormon that fits multiple societies, happens to fit the one he found in Central America. But you could go to China and find similar things. So that's why, for me, the archaeology and anthropology and descriptions are all neutral. You can find them anywhere, including... So, in but but can't, the can't the Heartland model also have confirmation bias? Sure, totally. Yeah. The confirmation bias is that we believe what Joseph and Oliver said. <laughs> so, so we we our our effort is to corroborate and support what they said. Not we're not making efforts to refute and deny and repudiate what they said. That's the big difference. Okay, so that's really the the linchpin on all this. Then I mean, yeah. it's not just the plates being in. That that to me is the linchpin being right there. That's that's what everything. The whole discussion to me is, hey, the plates were in New York. How do they yeah. get there? Why are they there? That that to me would be everything because it's the only thing we absolutely for sure know, and you can't misinterpret it. Right. It, the plates are in that hill, regardless of what you call it. Right? right. So so that to me is the one linchpin. But you're saying the linchpin is going back to were Joseph and Oliver correct in their statements? Did they know what they were saying? Did what were, yeah. were were they or or were they assuming something? That they, based on the, what, the translation of the Book of Mormon and, and understanding some of these place names, were they just assuming that Moroni yeah. had led them to what was Hill Cumorra? Yeah, and, that, and that's the rationale for the MTC advocates. They say that, well, it wasn't a revelation. Uh, Joseph never recorded a revelation about this, which is a little bit uh, disingenuous because Lucy says that Here's an, an example of this, of this idea of the um, the spiral of silence that nobody wants to talk about, <laughs> because Lucy in her history said that the very first night when Moroni came to Joseph Smith, he told them the record was in a, the hill of Camorra. That's where it all started. But they're going to say that she's she's looking back on this, thinking that that's what the tradition was. 
I know, and it's it, it's it's another example of this confirmation bias because they accept everything Lucy said except for what she said about Kimura. And then she went on to say that um, she it was really good insight there because she she also said that it was underneath the, he had to remove the moss and the grass from the rock before he uncovered it, which is a little detail that's only found in her history, and that's that's an indicia of credibility to me because. If, otherwise, if this big rock had been exposed all these centuries, someone might have dug it up, right? Mm -hmm. But she, Moroni told him that he had to remove the moss and grass from it, which I love that little detail. Mm -hmm. But she also said that in 1827, in, this, in the winter, before he even got the plates, he was passing by the hill Kamora. That's how he described it in his own words. She, she put it in quotes in her history because he was coming home late and they wondered what happened. And he said, well, I was passing by the Hill Camorra and Moroni stopped or the angel stopped me and told me I hadn't been diligent and all this stuff. So he was re referring it and the whole family knew it was Camorra before he even got the plates. And then in 1830 on his mission, Oliver Cowdery was telling the Indians that Moroni called the Hill Camorra anciently. So it all, it's all corroborated. And then we have the, you know, when David Whitmer first heard about the Hill Camorra on the trip to Fayette, if you want to talk about that at some point. But so there's, you know, to say that um, Joseph never recorded a revelation is is a little bit of a strained argument because he was talking about what Moroni told him. If, if Whether that's a revelation or not, we can decide. If an angel well, yeah, you could say that's a revelation. It's coming from the angel's mouth. I mean, they're stating that this is what came from Moroni's mouth. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. But they say that's not a revelation. So, well, it's not in the Doctrine and Covenants, I guess, stated <laughs> that way as a revelation. Yeah. But yeah. OK, so so here's another issue, though, I, I would bring up on this. So Camorra is kind of the anchor. I think that's right. right. I, is this Hill Camorra? Um, I'm going to get back to the RLDS Community of Christ stuff here in a minute. But OK. You, you write. I, I, my understanding is there's actually two anchor points in this, and we're going to kind of kind of build out the Heartland Model Hill a, a little bit more. Okay. Um, here's what Brant Gardner, in response to your a couple of your books, has, has written. He says, "For the Heartland hypothesis, the two identified locations are the Hill Camorra in New York and the city of Zarahemla. There is a long tradition of accepting the New York Hill. He calls it a tradition as the Book of Mormon Camorra." The identification of Zarahemla comes from Doctrine and Covenants 125.3, which states, let them build up a city under my name upon the land opposite the city of Nauvoo, and let the name of Zarahemla be named upon it. That one is different to me. Yeah, as far I agree. As, as far as being a solid anchor. I don't see how Zarahemla is a solid anchor. Right. Okay. Can, can you explain I, I, I how that would be assault? Because if yeah. it's if they're just as an example, I mean, we know there's a river Sidon in the Book of Mormon, but there's a, there's Sidon in in Phoenicia. Right. So they're just renaming it to something else. So you could be yeah. doing the exact same thing here across the Mississippi, right? So sure. so why why is that? Do you hold that as another anchor point in the model? Well, it, th let me back up a little bit because this, the issue of Zarahemla is separate from Camorra. Because we don't have anywhere near the uh, unequivocal statement like we had in letter seven about Camorra. Mm -hmm. All it is is that verse in the Doctrine and Covenants. So when I wrote my book on Moroni's America, I said, well, I'm going to, I consider Camorra as a pin in the map. You can't move that pin. Everything else is subject to interpretation or analysis or study and so on. And I said, as a hypothesis, not as a firm pin in the map, but as a hypothesis, I'm going to say, would it work if Sarah Hamlet is across from Nauvoo because of that that verse? Mm -hmm. And Looking I, at I, geographic I, passages and other things. Right, right. So I did, and I plugged it in, and to me, it looks plausible. And I explained all that in the book in a lot of detail. I went through all the verses and all the passages. I know other people who still adhere, who still believe Joseph and Oliver about Camorra, but they have different ideas about where Zarahemla is, and that's fine with me. Mm -hmm. I've even shown maps all the way from the hemispheric model, North and South America with Camorra, New York, down to a Mesoamerican model with Camorra, New York, down to kind of the heartland, which is the whole Midwest 
with Camorra, New York. And there's people that believe the whole thing took place in Western New York. But they're all Camorra, New York Camorra centric. And I'm fine with any of those. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, until we have more revelation. I think the brethren have been very clear from the beginning that Camorra's in New York, but we don't know where the rest of the events took place. You think they're still clear on that today? Well, they, don't, they never say anything about it today. And, and we can talk about why, too, if you want. Well, but, let's talk about why. Why don't they say anything about well, it? Well, before before we talk about <laughs> why, <laughs> let's, let's talk about the, this idea of the heartland. I, I don't... I don't want it to be a set in stone idea. I don't think that's what unites people. I think people who still believe Joseph and Oliver have a variety of opinions about the rest of it. And it makes sense because the archaeology is so, um, there were like something like 100,000 mound sites when the Europeans arrived here. And most of them have been destroyed. Most of them have been destroyed to the point where you can't find them even with LIDAR. Anymore. This is the, from the Hopewell culture? Hopewell and Adina, yeah. And so to, to identify a particular site as a particular city is problematic in my view. But it's not because there's not enough evidence, it's because there's too much evidence. You, you can't narrow it down. And so I've, I've talked with people, you know, people contact me all the time and say, well, you believe in multiple working hypotheses, how about my idea? I say, great, let's add it to the conversation. And so I have, <laughs> you wouldn't believe the number of heartland-oriented models that I've been given to consider. And I consider them all plausible. I just happen to think, I'm persuaded by the um, Zarahemla across from Nauvoo for several reasons. But it, it seems to fit the geography description that, as I understand it. But I'm not saying it, it's as firm as Camorra, New York. Okay, so I want to go one more time. I'm going back again and beating a dead horse here. What you're saying specifically that mainstream Latter-day Saint scholarship does not believe Joseph and Oliver. Do they, do they, would they agree with that statement? I mean, Uh, yeah, we don't agree with it. We just, okay, well, I have to qualify. We're just making assumptions. I have to qualify a little bit by mainstream LDS. Uh, well, you know scholarship. what I mean, though. Well, because most of the historians all say they're ambig- or ambivalent about it, they're agnostic about it, mm-hmm. which I think is a little disingenuous because of the way they, they treated it in the Saints book and in the Joseph Smith papers, but that's what they say. So what it really boils down to is two or three people. You have Jack Welch, Dan Peterson, although he's equivocating more lately, and Brant Gardner. Mm-hmm. And then basically everybody involved with Book of Mormon Central are hardcore disbelieving Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery on Hill Kamar. For them, those guys were just ignorant speculators who misled the church. What you're saying, those three originally, Welch, Peterson, and Gardner, are yeah. more open. So they're, 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 the, they're the primary, um, what would I say? Move, pushers, movers and well, pushers. actually, I should back up because it was farms with with Jack and um, John Sorensen at the time. Of course, mm-hmm. John Sorensen has passed away, yeah. but he was the real strong advocate of the yes. thing. Yeah, I'm, and, it seems to me like everybody's trying to support his scholarship. Yeah, yeah, and see, I was, I kind of in the back of my mind, you know, they say that science progresses one death at a time. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, and so I was kind of thinking that. Because I, I had a class from John. I thought he was awesome. He really opened my mind about the Book of Mormon being a, an actual history and real people. So I, he was exemplary in that respect. But I think he was just off base by saying that Joseph and Oliver were wrong. And so I, I take his uh, his scholarship model of looking at science of archaeology, anthropology, geology, and all that, and but I wed it to what the prophets have said instead of detaching it from what the prophets have said. And so I was hoping that uh, I, I, that part of the impetus for MTC was to respect John Sorensen's scholarship. And then when he passed away, maybe it would, would open the door a little more to alternative ideas. But that hasn't happened. They're just as firmly 
attached to Mesoamerica as they ever were. And I've talked to the people at Book of Mormon Central several times. And I said, you guys are, are not Book of Mormon Central. You're Book of Mormon Central America. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because you won't even consider alternative ideas. You won't even present them to the public for assessment and comparison and evaluation. They just adamantly refuse. And and to me, that's the opposite of scholarship. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to get to that more as okay. we go through here. I want I want to build this out a little bit more so that people a lot of people yeah, that have, sure. don't even know what the Heartland model is and okay and how this looks. But so so going beyond, let's say you know, looking at at the hill in New York, mm-hmm. Rama slash Camora, right? Um, if that's Camora, then you look at some of the passages and you try to build this out and say, okay, what is the most plausible possible model? You see, you've got a, a number of alternatives, but, yeah. um, for you, you had said back in 2014 that, uh, you thought the, uh, the events of the book of Mormon probably took place in Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, and New York. Yeah. Those four, four, four states. Can you just give us a, a top-level idea good, of the geography of those four states? I, I should have had a map here to show, but you can put one in the link. We'll, in we'll put one in, sure. Notes. Okay, so the idea is that Lehi, first to start off with, when Lehi left the Arabian Peninsula, he sailed around Africa and crossed the Atlantic Ocean. That's the initial premise. Well, I, thought, which, I, I thought he was supposed to have landed at the back. That same model had him landing in Chile. No, that was that was the hemispheric model. That was the hemispheric model. Okay. Yeah, where they crossed the Pacific and landed in Chile. Yes. And then the Mezo guy said, "No, he didn't land in Chile. He went up north and landed in Guatemala." Well, it was was it Orson or Parley P that 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 had that him landing in Chile? Yeah, Orson yeah. Pratt. It was he actually put it in the 1879 Book of Mormon footnotes. Okay. But when he put it there, that was an interesting distinction because he he put it is supposed or it is thought that Lehi landed in Chile, but he, and, and he had other um, hypotheticals about where Zarahemla was and so on, but he declared it was a fact that Camorra was in New York. Hmm. So he knew that it was in New York. Okay. But that, that whole Chile thing was based on the Frederick G. Williams note where he, he made a comment that Lehi landed at 30 degrees south latitude in Chile. And, and no one knows the provenance of that. My own suspicion is that he heard Joseph say it was 30 degrees latitude, and he assumed it was south when Joseph meant north. <laughs> where, where would 30 degrees north put you? In Florida. Interesting. And that's where we think Lehi landed. And, and there's lots of reasons land. for that. But part of it is – oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I'm going to interrupt you and, and, and just draw you back one more point here. So, So by the 1870s, at least some of the leadership of the church has moved from a North American model to a hemispherical model. Yeah, actually, it was in the early days of Joseph Smith, they started talking about a, a hemispheric model. In fact, if the Wentworth letter was is a good example of this, because a lot of people don't realize the Wentworth letter was basically Joseph Smith editing Orson Pratt's pamphlet he had written in 1840. And you can, I've done a side by side comparison, I'm sure others have too, where you can see where he made changes to what Orson Pratt had written. Rather than write it from scratch, he just adapted it because Orson Pratt did a pretty good job explaining the origins of the church. And so Orson Pratt went on for two or three pages about how the, uh, the Indians, he called them, in Central America were the Lamanites and Nephites. And Joe Smith crossed all that out and he said, the remnant of, of Lehi are the Indians that now live in this country, now inhabit yes. this country. Yeah, I've and seen so that. when I when you read those side by side, you can see he was correcting the hemispheric model and mm-hmm. saying, no, they're the, the people who live in this country. Would you so, say that the majority still, certainly of the older generation, believe in a hemispheric model? Or, are we, well, or have we moved more to the Mesoamerican? I, it, I haven't seen any polls on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I know when I grew up, it was a hemispheric model. Yeah, that's that's what I knew early on was the hemisphere. Yeah. Our teachers would tell us, oh, the scientists are all wrong. That No one came across the Bering Strait. They all came with Lehigh, you know. Okay, yeah. And, and so we were convinced that the whole world was wrong and we were right and all that. Yeah. But then... When I when I went to BYU about the time farms was starting up and, and making progress, I thought, you know, that makes sense that it wouldn't be a whole hemisphere. 
And so it made sense that it was in a limited area. And I didn't know, frankly, they never told anybody, but I didn't know what Joseph and Oliver had said about the Hill Cumorah. And we didn't have the Joseph Smith papers. The references are very obscure, you know. And yeah. so all we had was the times and seasons, and that's what everybody went by. All right. So I want to bring us back here off that tangent. So back to Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, and New yeah, York. Yeah, okay. What, what is the... the- the, the okay, the, of, of the geography there. The gist of it is that they, Lehigh landed in Florida, the Panhandle of Florida, most likely around Tallahassee. And then when Nephi left his brothers, he took his followers up to Tennessee around the Chattanooga area. So the and land of Nephi would be in Florida? No, in, in Chattanooga, in Tennessee. So, okay, so the land of Nephi is in Chattanooga. The original right. area, though, before they, before they split, would have been in the Panhandle of Florida. Yes, yes, okay. exactly. And then um, when, you know, the Lamanites came up and King Mosiah and King had to leave the people or, or take the people to flee from the Lamanites. And they went north to the land of Zarahemla, right, where they met the people of Zarahemla. And so all along, I had been taught, and I, I think most people agree, that they were they went on a north flowing river. And that's why... There were some editions of the Book of Mormon, or at least some commentaries, that said the river Sidon flowed north. And what everybody apparently forgot about was the Tennessee River flows north. And so when he left the land of Nephi around Chattanooga and went north, the Tennessee River flows right up to, to Illinois. So I agree with all the people who say this river, um, it wasn't the river Sidon, but the north flowing river that King Mosiah went on to or followed to get to Zarahemla flowed north. That makes sense to me. That's why the land of Nephi is higher than Zarahemla. Well, I'm looking right now at Tallahassee. I had almost due north, a little bit west. I got Nashville right there. Yeah. And, and well, Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Chattanooga is actually almost due north of Tallahassee. Yeah, yeah. And there's a river that goes up there called the um, Flint River because the Indians would always go there to get their Flint. Hmm. And if you remember when when uh, Nephi left, he said his brother's hearts were like flint. Mm. So there's that metaphor that it was evoked by the river, in my view, anyway. So they go up to Chattanooga area, and there's a big hill there where you can look out over and see seven states from the top and so on. There, there's a huge archaeological park there that hasn't really ever been explored. That, that's a, We could get on a big tangent if you want me to talk about Chattanooga. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, I let's say that for another time. A kid. Yeah, another time. But anyway, so the, the idea is that they left uh, area, went up to Illinois, landed. There's no city of Zarahemla until the Book of uh, Alma. Uh-huh. So there, they, it was still kind of a rural uh, society with no city. Eventually, they ended up up where around Nauvoo where the city of Zarahemla was. At least it makes sense that it's there. Other people think it's in different places. But there's lots of reasons why we think Zarahemla was up by Nauvoo. And so from there, that became the center of the society, not the geographical center, but the political and cultural center. And then in the- well, other let me just say, let me link these together with the Book of Mormon. And so you're saying the Chattanooga area is the land of Nephi. Land of Nephi, yeah. Mm-hmm. Illinois is the land of Zarahemla. So this would be coming back later on after Zarahemla. This is where Abinadi and King Noah would have been. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they would have come back up to the Chattanooga area. And and there's lots of mounds, mound cities and structures that date to Book of Mormon times all up in Tennessee there. Mm-hmm. So then in the Alma chapters, when they started expanding into Bountiful, that's the Ohio area. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Ohio primarily. And there's there's um, lots of sites in Ohio that date to book warm time periods that fit the descriptions and so on. And so then from there, when the Lamanites finally in the final battles came and chased them and they retreated for years. So hold on. So you're saying yeah. Bountiful. What about, but not Zarahemla? Well, Zarahemla is still in Illinois. Okay, so you got that. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted to clarify that. So, yeah. so going further okay. up north into Ohio, we're looking at the areas of Bountiful. Right. And then when the in the final battles with uh, uh, Mormon, General Mor- Mormon, they were in retreat for several years up to the northeast, up until western New York, and they ended up at Camorra. 
So that's the, the overall geography. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, they, we, the Book of Mormon only gives us less than one one hundredth of their history. So there's lots of other things going on. But the, so, so thinking about the text of the Book of Mormon, you you're after all the destruction, the coming of Christ, Third Nephi. Um, are they? I, I'm trying to remember. Are they mostly then up in the northern area? I mean, he comes to Christ comes to the Temple at Bountiful, right? Are they mostly now just residing up in that area, up in the north? It's it's hard to say yeah. whether they were in, you know, how many were living in the Zarahemla area versus Bountiful area. I, I don't think there's any indication in the scriptures how many people were living where. There's a list of cities involved, but it doesn't really say where they were. So he's getting Morona or Mormon and or Mormon is is being pushed further and further north right. in the battle. Um, they're they're concentrating their forces, and they end up having one major battle left that is at the exact same hill that the Jaredites had it at. Yeah, Rama. And 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 you're getting into another interesting topic about how big that battle was. Yes. But we might, I don't know if you want to talk about that now. Or, sure. Let's, what, what, is, what was it? Well, what, well let's, what is your, let's preface your mind, it. How many people? Okay. Let's preface it by saying, why would he go to Camorra? Right? Mormons in retreat. The cities are being burned. The people are being killed off. They're fleeing. Why would he pick Camorra of all places? And, and people have asked me that. And I said, well, it seems kind of obvious that he knew that that was the Jaredite fortress for their final battles. He knew he had to get the plates from the hill in, um, where Amron had kept them, the hill Shem. Mm-hmm. He had to get those plates because the Nepo- or Lamanites were overrunning that land. They might take them and destroy them all, right? So he had to get those plates. He was in a rush. Where's he going to hide all this repository? And then he realized, oh, the Jaredites had a fortress in Camorra. So he, that's why he went to Camorra, in my view. And there was already an underground bunkers there and a fortress there from the Jaredites, even though it had been, you know, a millennia or so. Well, they may have already known about it because, I mean, obviously you know that there's the history there of the excursion from the land of Nephi. Right. Where where they find the 24 plates. Right, exactly. So they knew about it. Whether they had explored it or not, I don't know. You have to kind of assume they had. And so um, that's why I think he went to Camorra. It wasn't because it was... uh, the biggest mountain in the world or whatever. You know, it was because there was already a fortress there that he could employ and, and kind of revitalize and, and preserve the records. Hmm. So that all makes sense to me. And in fact, it turns out in Western New York, there's a bunch of rudimentary uh, fortifications built by the Hopewell around 400 AD. And, and so it all fits the narrative the archeology span does. So then um you get into the issue of how big were these battles at Camorra, right? And this is this is where it's, my approach to interpreting the scriptures differs from the Mazo guys. Because I look at it and I say, okay, I'm going to assume that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery told the truth. Therefore, I'm going to interpret the Book of Mormon based on that knowledge. Mm-hmm. So... A surface reading of the Book of Mormon, you've had people say there were millions of people killed at Camorra because of the Jaredites, right? But when you actually read the passage, the two millions of people that Coriantum was talking about was several years before the final battle. I don't know how anyone ever thought that millions of people were killed at Camorra because it doesn't it doesn't come close to saying that. Mm-hmm. And in fact, when I read that, I think he's looking back at his entire history of his people, how many were killed in war. It's like saying, how many Americans were killed in war? Well, which war are you going to add them all up, right? If you're an anti-war person, you say, you know, two million Americans have died in war. Well, it wasn't in one war, or one battle, mm-hmm. but it was a civil war, World War II, et cetera. And that's how I see Coriantumr looking back and thinking about Ether's prophecies and saying, Boy, in our history, we've had two million people killed in in wars, you know, and now this is going to be yet one more. Anyway, that was several years before the final battle. And when you look at the the last part of Ether, when he describes how many people survived each day in that week-long battle, I I just ran a little spreadsheet and went backwards, and it's under 10,000 that were at at Jaredites. And that makes sense, because when Oliver Cowdery discussed this, he said there were thousands 
of Jaredites killed there. He didn't say tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, just thousands. And then when he came to talk about the um, Nephites and the Lamanites, he said tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. And that's significant because when you go back and read Mormon 6, 6, or 6, chapter 6 in, in particular, he says that my 10,000 and Moroni's 10,000, they could see from the top of the hill that mm -hmm. had been killed. And and what I'm what I believe is that that's not a precise number. It's a military unit. Mm -hmm. And I give the example of um, Xenophon, who was a Greek soldier who wrote the Anabasis about the, war, the Persian wars and stuff. And he had a unit of 10,000 when they started off. But by the time they got back, there were only 6,000, I think, of them left. But they were still called 10,000. Yeah, so, they yeah, do that with so three, even, even the 300, they do the same thing. Yeah, yeah. It's like a battalion or something. Mm -hmm. And it's a very common number in armies around the world. So when we look at that, I, I don't think there were 20,000 people killed there. It was t two military units of mm -hmm. unknown numbers. Could have been 3,000, 5,000, 1,000, who knows? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, then, so, but what about well, those thousand, those thousand, those two, three thousand uh, uh, Nephites and Lamanites, and then uh, however many Jaredites? Where are the bones? That's one of the things that always comes up. Where are okay. all the bones? Well, let, let, before we talk about that, because he goes on and lists uh, another 21 generals and their 10,000 who were killed. Yes. Right? And everybody assumes he's talking again about the final battle at Camorra. Hmm. But when you when, when you think he had been a general since the time he was 16 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And he'd been in battles his entire adult life. So I think he's doing the same thing that Coriantumr did, where he's looking back and thinking of all his generals and all their military units that had died during his career, mm -hmm. or maybe even just during the, the, the beginning of the final conflict, whether they were leaving from Ohio. It's more the, the war than the battle, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Good way to put it. So where are all the bones? Well, it even says in there that they didn't bury them. Mm -hmm. If you don't bury bones, they last two or three years and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And then the other, so it, let's say that there were just roughly 5,000 left of each of the two units, Moronites and Mormons, maybe an equivalent number of Lamanites, max 20,000, 20 to 30,000, let's say, in this battle, which is still substantial. But it's not millions of people, and it's not even hundreds of thousands of people. And it's easily fought. Oliver Cowdery said, if you stand on the hill Cumorah and you look west, there's another ridge a mile away that's parallel. And it was between those two hills that this battle took place. That's how specific he was about this. Who, who said that? Morona? Oliver Cowdery. Oliver Cowdery. Yeah. And so he, he said within that, um, somehow my hand raised. I didn't yeah, mean I saw to do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> it, my mouse did it automatically, I guess. Anyway, so um, the, uh, th that valley is a mile wide, and you could easily accommodate, well, the, the pageant audience is bigger than that, and they only go down to the uh, road from the mm -hmm. Hill Camorra. So that valley easily accommodates. I don't know why it keeps raising my hand, I guess. <laughs> there we go. Um, the, um, you could easily accommodate say 20,000, tens of thousands, like Oliver said. And then you'd have the bones, which wouldn't last more than two or three years at the most. You'd have whatever implements of war they had. And that could be, we don't even know really what they had. I know some of the, the critics will say they had chariots and all that. Well, it, the text doesn't say that. And so the victorious Lamanites would naturally take whatever useful material was left. And this was still, you know, 400 AD, roughly, let's say. And by the time the Europeans came a thousand years later, over a thousand years later, the Seneca and other tribes in that area were constantly going through there. They would have picked up everything that was worth anything. And so I, I th it's interesting that when um, Heber C. Kimball joined the church in 1832, he said in his journal, he said he went to the Hill Camorra and he could still see the fortification there, or the embankments there. And so that made me curious. I don't know if, if you know this, but so I bought a house out in Palmyra to live out there and get a sense for the place. Mm. We actually had the, the house closest to the Hill Camorra of anybody 
in the church, except for the mission or the site director that lived in the visitor center. But we could walk to the Hill Cumorah from our house. We'd walk back and forth during pageant stuff. And so I know a little bit about what it's like out there. And the, um, the every year, I, well, let me back up. So I, I met an archaeologist out there in New York, Western New York. And, and I said, well, how can I find some artifacts? And he said, well, every spring, just follow the plows around and you'll find some because they're so abundant out here. And unfortunately, I, I tried it in one farm that was pretty far from Kimura, but I didn't try it at our house for a variety of reasons. Partly I wasn't living there in the spring. And so, but the museums and, and people, collectors have all kinds of artifacts out there. The University of Buffalo has over a million artifacts from Western New York, many of them from Hopewell sites. He gave us, he gave me a list of the Hopewell sites out there that they don't put on display because they don't have the budget for it. So there's an abundance of, of artifacts and whether they all were Lamanite Nephite, probably not because of the ensuing years with the other Indians coming through there. But there's no reason to expect a bunch of big pile of bones or an abundance of uh, war implements after over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a mismatch between expectations and misreading the text versus reality. Okay. So one more site I would have an interest in that, that I think yeah. is very important uh, in, in the Book of Mormon. Where would you put the hill Shiloh? Well, that's a, a pretty vague description of where Shiloh is, right? Uh -huh. But as I recall, I had it north of Chattanooga. Okay. Yeah, that because based on, again, secondhand accounts, that is where Mosiah stops. I'm talking about Grandpa Mosiah. Yeah. That is where Mosiah stops on his way to Zarahemla. Right. And gets the breastplate and the Urim and Thummim. Yeah. He picks them up there at Shiloh, and then he's able to translate the 24 plates because now he's a seer. He's got the, the instruments that he's able to do right. do that with. So, well, And that's, that's, that's also, pretty of course, where, where they keep coming back to. They stop there before they come down into the land of, of Nephi yeah. over and over again. Yeah, and, you know, when I was into the Tennessee thing, I went out there and spent some time looking all around, find the waters of Mormon and all this stuff. And it's a, the same issue. There's so many potential sites that are amazing. Mm -hmm. Chattanooga is in a little valley, but it's surrounded by really high hills and prominent hills. And there's all kinds of cool, awesome places up to build or out or those kind of things. It's mm -hmm. also very rich in uh, mining gold and silver, for example. The first gold rush was in North Carolina, not far from there. So there's a lot of a very interesting archaeology and anthropology in that area. But I, I'm reluctant to identify any particular site as a particular Book of Mormon site, just because there's so many possibilities. I want to go back now into, I want to, I want to talk about this division between, mm -hmm. uh, you know, let's call it again, the, 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 the hegemonic <laughs> narrative <laughs> right. that's out there yeah. with Mesoamerica, which I have no problem with. But it, and then and then dividing this off to what we would call the heartland model. And now those that follow it, the heartlanders. Right. I mean, that's just yeah. kind of like there's which is very much growing. I mean, it's there's a yeah. lot of people that are starting to say, wait a minute here. This this seems more yeah. correct to me. There's a statement that you, that you make here in one of your 24 points of, of having to believe the, uh, the Mesoamerican model that says Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, who I met was wrong and unqualified when he warned that the two Camorras theory would cause members to become confused and disturbed in their faith in the Book of Mormon. Now, this brings us right back to the beginning of this episode mm -hmm. where we talked about why is this important? Why does yeah. it matter? Well, I guess according to Joseph Fielding Smith, this was going to confuse people with their faith in the Book of Mormon. That's right. certainly something there, right? That I would say to me, yeah. I, I just, I don't see it as much, but Joseph Fielding Smith happens to be a very conservative person. Right. Right. And so you you what I see here is this dividing line 
happening in scholarship and 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 let's call it academia on one side and then there's this conservative scholarship that is different from from what academia is doing. why are these lines drawn in this way because i can go on and on about other I can call them tenets, but but beliefs of what the heartlanders might believe are going to be more along the lines of orthodoxy they're, they're more along the lines of, okay, what exactly did the prophets say? They're more along the lines of, of uh, even literalism, uh, being literalist. It's, there, there is a very distinct line. It's not just where is the Book of Mormon, where did the Book of Mormon take place? It's almost like there's a psychology behind it, in my mind, sometimes. Yeah, that, that, that I, I agree. And part. I, I think it's because of the fundamental premise. And that is that, and I, I hate to categorize people, but for easy yeah, I don't mean politically. I just like, mean, I mean personality. Let's say Heartlanders. Okay. Yeah. So the basic premise of the Heartland idea is that we believe what Joseph and Oliver said. The basic idea of the Mesoamerican thing is that we don't believe what Joseph and Oliver said. So that's that's really where the division is. And so they'll try to say, well, yeah, maybe they said that, but they weren't speaking as prophets or they didn't have a revelation. It's just their opinion and they were wrong. And I said, well, how do you know they were wrong? And they say, because we are credentialed, we have PhDs, and we're the experts, and we can interpret the Book of Mormon, and it means Central America. That's the, that's the approach Jack Welch takes and Dan Peterson. And and that's why it's a division because uh, you know I, I I don't consider myself an intellectual but other people tell me I am <laughs> and and I don't I don't I mean there there's an element of intellectualism that is a negative connotation because no I've got a love hate relationship with academia trust me it's yeah it's, there's exactly. a love hate relationship there yeah and so but for example I give you a, when I moved to Oregon. I had some heartlanders say, how could you move to a blue state? You know? <laughs> and I said, well, what are you talking about? It's the United States. Look, look, at, look out my window. I know. <laughs> well, there's that. But also, it's awesome. People here are wonderful. You know, I just love it here. And so um, I, I, I am not aligned with the the political stuff that some often is associated with heartlanders. And in fact, I'm not going to name names, but there is a person at the um, Book of Mormon Central who told me that the reason they refused to put Heartland stuff on there is because Heartlander is a bunch of right wing nationalists. Uh, see, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it ends up being political. It just does. It, it's ridiculous. It does end up being political. And and it's I, I was just going to th- did you have, were you going to follow up on that thought? Well, I was just going to say how how absurd that is, because they don't realize that there's heartlanders all around the world and who had who couldn't care less about american politics yes but they read the book of mormon and they say and they look at the history of the hopal and adina and all that and they say well that only makes sense why are we even talking about mesoamerica and it I always say, ends up political it just it just always ends up political the other the other ingredient in this is the rlds church that the community of christ because yeah that is a body, a, a religious body that is much less conservative than the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Yeah, and and their history seems to be a part of that, mm-hmm. right? So they're they're that infusion of of their history of of Camorra and and others, polygamy, even is different yeah. from ours, right? And and yet. From that side, those talking points are becoming more and more prevalent in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Whether it's whether it's Camorra and and the, the Mesoamerican model or polygamy or many other things, there seems to be this. And, and again, the one of the the big differing. It's not just two different bodies. It's one's more conservative and one's more liberal. Yeah. It, well, it, and I, academia I, is more liberal. It just is. It's just going to. Yeah. It's, it's it's going to take a, uh, uh, a more of a liberal approach. Well, for me, you know, I I hope it doesn't boil down to you know academia versus non-credentialed people, because I I still 
I'm an optimist, and I, I think it's possible for academics to recognize that the Hillcomore in New York makes more sense, mm-hmm. e- apart from what Joseph and Oliver said. But it's, it's a real serious problem when you so start saying that Joseph and Oliver were wrong, and that's your whole premise for your, your theory. Mm-hmm. Because then you, you just pile on with all this confirmation bias. As an example, Book of Mormon Central, they you know they claim neutrality, but they have a Spanish web page where they go into detail about their Mesoamerican model. And they're trying they're opening a center down in Pueblo, Mexico, where they're they're indoctrinating the Spanish speaking members to believe that the Mesoamerican is correct. So I met a, a former state president from Guatemala. And I asked him to help me translate the, my letter seven book into Spanish because I'd already done it, but I wanted the colloquialisms and stuff. And he read that and he says, what the heck is this? I've never heard anything about this before. Oliver Cowdery said Camorra's in New York. And I said, yeah, it's right in the Joseph Smith papers. And he was dumbstruck. He said, well, why are they telling us all this other stuff? And I said, I wish I could answer that, but I, I can't justify what Jack Welch is doing at all. Not for a minute. And so I think those guys are causing really serious problems. It's going to be equivalent to the DNA problem, you know? Well, isn't this, though, something that's naturally going to happen? I mean, you have to go in some direction. Uh, otherwise, you have nothing to write. You're, you're, you're going in some direction with this. But it's interesting, you know, I mean, the, the, the Saints series is, is so yeah. popular right now. And, and it's almost taken as doctrine. It's like it's scripture for, yeah. for most people. And you know you've got the example of uh of the of one of the uh, volume 1 where they completely erased Camorra from the historical record yeah it's right there in volume 1 so even in the book saints there is certainly an agenda yeah that is that is putting being inserted into in, into uh well a, a narrative that's being created yeah i know um, maybe off the record i'll tell you more about the background of that okay <laughs> when we're done recording <laughs> You yeah, and I are going to talk. Okay. Okay. All right. But to me, the the Saints book is is I, I don't want to call it a disaster, but it's close to a disaster. Really? Because because of that, Kamara a disaster. Issue. Yeah, because they're they're educating the entire world that Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery misled the church about Kamara and about the translation, which I don't know if we have time to talk about that. And so everything else in there that they say is fine. But when you undermine those two pillars, the origin and the the setting of the Book of Mormon, by saying Joseph and Oliver were wrong and they misled everybody, then how do you how do you say they were right about everything except those two issues, the origin and the setting of the Book of Mormon? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's just causing chaos. Well, I hope that there could be some kind of a opening up. I mean, that's what research is supposed to be. That's what scholarship yeah, is supposed to be. I'm I such agree. a big fan of Jack Welch and and Dan Peterson yeah. and Brant Gardner and and all these guys over there. And and I think Book of Mormon Central is doing an amazing job. I, I just we don't know what we don't know. And it, it's nice if there's a little bit more of an open mind and, and, and not a specific narrative that's uh, I hundred percent agree. I mean I would I would love and I've offered both the interpreter and Book of Mormon Central. I said, look, I'd be happy to contribute a Heartland perspective on your peer reviews, for example. Mm-hmm. They absolutely refused. Yeah, I've, I've said I'll write a neutral kind of a thing to, uh, to explain why the Heartland is the way it is, and they absolutely refuse. Well, they it's kind of a gatekeeping that. position, isn't it? Well, it is. Yeah, yeah I mean, you yeah. end up being a gatekeeper, and I think that they feel that responsibility. And if you have that idea of this is the right narrative, then you're going to gatekeep. <laughs> I know. And they and can. And they're at the gate. <laughs> but that's that's why it's a fallacy to even call it Book of Mormon Central. It's not Book of Mormon Central. It's Book of Mormon Central America. <laughs> that's all it is. And the other thing is, I you know, I had um, I have a seminary and institute manual from the, the 90s, I think it was. And right in there, they talk about Camorra. And they quote these things, you know, letter seven. They quote Marion G. Romney, who President Romney's address in general conference when he talked about Kimura. He, he was sent out to the pageant on assignment, came back in general conference and reported on it. And he declared unequivocally again, that that was where the Nephites and the Jaredites met their demise, right in general conference. And it was in the Institute manual, 
a long quotation from his talk. That's all been removed. Yeah. And so the kids who went to seminary, let's say in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, learned what the prophets had taught. Now they they never learn it. Yeah. That's and interesting. Book of Mormon Central, I think, is is depriving people of making informed decisions about Well, again, it's that gatekeeping that seems to yeah. be happening. We're going to transition yeah. over to uh, the translation right now, which is a, probably going to be a separate episode. So okay. where can the, uh, the listeners here find more information about what you have written? What, what What's one or two books that you would recommend? Well, if read? it's on Komora, I wrote a book called Between These Hills. It's a case for the New York Camorra where I summarize a lot of this stuff. The, the My most popular book on this topic is Moroni's America, where I kind of outline the overall geography using the, the geographical passages in the Book of Mormon. So those two books. And then I have a web page called Letter 7, Letter V-I-I, because I use a Roman numeral, just letter7.com. It's a blog, but it has a lot of references in there. Okay. And then the last one that I'm we're working on developing more is the Museum of the Book of Mormon. It's called Mobom M O B O M dot org. And I have stuff about the different theories in there, so I'm, I'm not you know putting my thumb on the You're scale. You're not gatekeeping. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gatekeeping. I have links to Book of Mormon Central. I think people should know that they're there and what they're doing. And so that's that's intended to be just a really a Museum of the Book of Mormon. Um, on all the different topics, all the perspectives. Okay, great. We'll put the links in the description box of yeah. okay. each of those things. We are going to leave this episode for those that want to find out, uh, listen more about the translation, talking about the how the book was translated, the Book of Mormon was translated, the Peep Stone, the Seer Stone versus the Urim and Thummim, then catch the next episode on this. Mm-hmm.